Good morning everyone, welcome to this time of worship. Thank you so much for letting me join you wherever you are today so that we can join together to worship God. My name is Karen Harbison and I'm the Minister of Westbourne Parish Church in Greenock. This is our time of worship, our time of reflection for Sunday the 4th of July when we continue to read from the story of David in 1st and 2nd Samuel. Today we think about David becoming king, first of Judah and then of Israel. The psalmist says, How good it is to give thanks to you, O Lord, to sing in your honour, O Most High God, to proclaim your constant love every morning, and your faithfulness every night. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. God, we call you King and Lord, and more than that, omnipotent, majestic, King of Kings, the mighty Lord of hosts. We do it because we want to honour you, and these are the biggest words we can find. But we do a disservice and lead ourselves astray if we imagine that you are anything like the flawed human beings who rule the nations of this world, even the best of them, in danger of being corrupted by the power that they wield. Your kingdom is different, O oh God, and we forget that at our peril. Leadership for you is always to do with service. Honour is given to the ones who least expect it, and the ones who think they deserve to be first will find themselves at the back of the queue. Forgive us, gentle God, if we have sought power for the wrong reasons or used it selfishly. Forgive us if we have valued wealth or status above kindness, honesty and compassion. Forgive us that the structures of the church are often indistinguishable from those of other institutions, our rivalries and power struggles, a betrayal of the one we claim to serve. Help us here and now to renew our commitment to Jesus, the Good Shepherd, the Servant King, the one who refused all earthly honours, who chose to die rather than to rule by force, whose life ended in what was seen as humiliation and failure and who has warned us very clearly what the cost will be if we are serious about following him. Take us as we are, O oh God, and make us fit to be part of the kingdom whose only law is love. Make us small enough, weak enough, foolish enough to trust you for all that we need, and may there be no glory in it for us, but only for you. And for Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today we read about David being anointed as king by the elders and naming the city of Jerusalem the city of David. It's a partner reading with that of bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city, which we'll read next week. So let us hear the word of God from 2 Samuel at chapter 5 verses 1 to 5 and then verses 9 to 10. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said to him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even when Saul was still our king, you led the people of Israel in battle. And the Lord promised you that you would lead his people and be their ruler. So all the leaders of Israel came to King David at Hebron. He made a sacred alliance with them. They anointed him and he became king of Israel. 
David was 30 years old when he became king and he ruled for 40 years. He ruled in Hebron over Judah for seven and a half years and in Jerusalem over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. After capturing the fortress, David lived in it and named it David's city. He built the city around it, starting at the place where land was filled in on the east side of the hill. He grew stronger all the time because the Lord Almighty was with him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us and the word of God among us. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's interesting to think about how places are often named after people. Fort William, Keith, Neilston, Helmsborough, Campbelltown, St Andrews, to name but a few. And of course, places and streets and towns and cities are often named after people too. Lyle Hill, Sir Michael Street, Watt Street, and you know many more in this town than I do. I wonder what people would think about Jerusalem being referred to as David's city. Over the years, David's life is a mixture of experiences and some of those to us looking on, reading about them now, seem to be experiences which show negative aspects of David's character, his flaws and shortcomings, which were scrutinized and sometimes bravely challenged as we will hear about when we read about David and Nathan. In today's story, we see David, after many years and many battles, eventually becoming king, uniting the nations and being anointed in Jerusalem, naming it David's city. David had reached an important point in his life. It had been a long time since Saul had come to Bethlehem to Jesse's family convinced that among Jesse's sons, there was the future king of all Israel. Samuel had anointed David and God's spirit came upon David. There was a long period of time between David's anointing by Samuel as God's chosen king and him being anointed by the people as their chosen king. David has learned much and experienced much in the in-between years his apprenticeship, if you like, and now his call as king is confirmed by the people. David was at an important crossover point in his life. As well as celebrating the moment, I wonder if he took time to look back over the years and consider how God had called him, chosen him, equipped him, sustained him, journeyed with him, given him people as companions and mentors, taught him through grief as well as victories. I wonder if David took time to recognise in the present the affirmation of the people, their words and actions, their confidence and commitment, confirming him as king. I wonder if David took time to look to the future to consider how he could live and act and rule, to be the kind of leader God wanted him to be, to commit himself to really be the shepherd of God's people Israel. What would that mean? What would that look like for David in his time and place and for the people he was called to lead? We all experience significant moments, crossover points, in our lives. Which crossover points can you remember? How did you navigate your way through those crossover points? In that moment, what part, if any, did looking back and looking forward play? Perhaps you're at a crossover point at this time. Perhaps, in a sense, we are all at some sort of crossover point at this time as the experiences of COVID and of lockdown have been so far out of our normal experience, have taken us in many ways beyond our usual reference points and fallback positions. And we do not only experience these crossover points as individuals, but also as families, groups, communities, and as a 
church. At all of our crossover points, it is important to take time to look back, to look back over the years, to consider how God has called us, equipped us, sustained us, journeyed with us, given us people as companions and mentors, taught us through both joys and sorrows, and in all the ordinary days in between, to think about our apprenticeship from then until now, about all the ways God has been getting us ready for something new, something different, a new stage in our lives. At all of our crossover points, it is important to take time to look around, to recognise in the present the affirmation of the people around us through their words and actions, to hear them saying, you can do this, you should do this. We have seen this in you. We see you growing, maturing into this, and we are with you as you continue in your journey of faith. At all of our crossover points, it is important to look to the future, to know that as God's people, we are always living towards God's future, investing in people and time still to come, to consider how we live and act, to be the kind of people God wants us to be, to commit ourselves to shepherd others, to love and care for others, to tend and nurture others, to take care of each other with compassion and to be God's people of grace and love and joy and generosity and justice and welcome in our time and place. May it be so among us. Amen. So let us join together now in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly monarch, we pray for our world which needs a servant king to wash the feet of those who have forgotten what it is to be touched, the lonely, the lost, the looked down on and the looked over ones. Hear our prayer, O God. We pray for our world which needs a unifier to bring together those who are enemies and those who have been pushed to the edges, the hungry, the poor, the ones who think they are in control and the ones fleeing from danger. Hear our prayer, O oh God. We pray for our world, which needs to remember whose we are and what we have been called to do and whose we have been called to be. Peacemakers, bread breakers, justice bringers. Hear our prayer, O oh God. We pray for our world, which needs leadership to renew our covenant with you, with our neighbours and with your creation, so that we can live well together, taking care of each other, being responsible with all you have entrusted to us. Hear our prayer, O God, and also these silent prayers of our hearts for those people and situations we are particularly concerned about today. O oh God, may your love and comfort sustain all those for whom we pray, this day and always. Amen. God, you are our rightful ruler, our one true Lord. As we go from here, teach us how to lead, how to unite, how to serve with love and humility. Go now. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen.